Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello and welcome to The Sociology Show. The Sociology Show podcast is brought to you in association with tutor to you the exam performance specialist for A-level and GCSE sociology students and teachers. And so you can visit the website, which is tutortoyou.net forward slash sociology. And once you're on the website, you can pick up revision guides, revision videos, flashcards, and everything else that you need for your A-level or GCSE sociology studies. And so on to today's episode, and I'm delighted to welcome Edil Garlip to the show. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for, thanks for having me. So do you want to start by telling us a little bit about who you are, what you do? Right. So, yeah, my name is Adil and uh, I'm a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Edinburgh. And I study the cultural economy of niche meme communities. I am originally from Turkey but have been in the UK for about four years now and um, kind of grew up in the Balkans, but also very much on the internet. So um, that's why I'm really interested in um, researching online communities because I was a kind of big participant in um, online subcultures. So that's what I'm studying now. It's a really, really fascinating uh, area for research. Is there many other people looking at a similar topic at all? Um, so is it, it's really fun. It's a lovely topic to, to study because you can, you can enter the field site basically whenever you want to. You don't yeah. have to get, um, yeah, you don't have to take a plane to get there. You don't have to, you know, um, meet gatekeepers. Well, you do kind of, but um, it's, it's so easy to get into. But the real um, problem is building enough kind of digital literacy to understand what's going on in these communities. Yeah. There are um, many people studying this topic at the moment, and it's kind of exploded very recently because of all these kind of, um, I guess, perhaps because everyone's shut in um, because of the pandemic and everyone's more online now. Yes. So they're seeing kind of the power of memes and seeing how easily they can uh, disseminate and go viral. But um, the kind of, I guess, the uh, founding scholars, you could um, say, of meme studies, I'd consider to be um, uh, Limor Schiffman, who uh, basically kind of wrote a lovely book um, about memes as kind of postmodern folklore. And uh, also Ryan Milner, who wrote his PhD thesis on, um, on the idea of the internet meme, which is called the World, um, Worldwide Meme, I think, uh, which is now a book. And there's so many other people. Very recently, I think um, um, Bradley Wiggins, he's written um, some stuff about, uh, I think, alt-right communities. There's uh, also the OI Lab at the University of Amsterdam. They look at far-right um, online communities and far-right memes, which is incredibly important now, um, kind of when we put everything in context with what's been happening, especially in the U.S. recently. Mm. So those are some of the people that I know. Obviously, I missed a lot, but I'm more interested in um, left leftist meme communities. So there are some people obviously working on that, but um, I'm more interested in memes that are not meant to go viral, that, right. are, meant, that are made with n maybe like a niche uh, audience in mind. So that uh, side of um, research, I don't think ha is as sprawling as let's say like alt-right meme research. Yeah. 
Could we could we start right from the very basics in terms of how you would define a meme? I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're all pretty pretty aware of what a meme is, you know, when it's on our phone. But what what would constitute being a meme? Yeah, so that's a that's a even though it's it's like a a basic question, it's quite difficult to answer because the problem is that everyone can recognize a meme meme when they see it, but it's really difficult to pinpoint what it exactly is. So one of the definitions is that it's a just a piece of culture, a unit of culture that is trans, um, transmitted between people. And as, as it's disseminated, it also morphs. So you can have, the, like, for instance, the Bernie meme. It was yeah. obviously when you look at it, it's Bernie on a chair, but then it's like um, it morphs into uh, Bernie doing different things in different settings. So that's why I'm mean by morphing um so that would be the kind of basic definition of a meme but um it's i think it's also important to um distinguish but be- between what a meme is and what an internet meme is because um we could also you know a fairy tale is a meme a myth is a meme a um a dance a form of dance is a meme because you know we've kind of try to repeat and disseminate culture for centuries now. Um, So the concept itself is just as old as human civilization, I think. But um, what happens is that when it's on the internet, it's disseminated much more quickly. Yeah, that's, that's, I guess uh, it, it might be more confusing now, but I think, yeah, basically a meme is like a piece of culture that gets transmitted and morphs as it does. It's interesting that you mentioned myths because was it Richard Dawkins who first kind of used the word meme or he's kind of got it into our general lexicon? Mm -hmm. Um, Definitely. So he's seen as um, usually when you read a kind of piece of research about internet memes, it will will usually start with, well, in 1975, Richard um, Dawkins used the word meme as, um, you know, a piece of cultural information. Um, so he is the person who's popularized it. And he's, I think, also um, the person who's behind our under like biological understanding of the meme. Because we, when we say meme, we think of things like virality or mutation, which are very biological things in their nature. But um, it originally comes from the Greek word um, mimesis, which means to imitate. Um, and... Um, the way it was used, it was kind of Plato talks about it, Aristotle talks, talks about it in his um, poetics, Benjamin talks about it. So it, as a concept, the imitation of everyday reality has always been there. For instance, um, something like uh, theatre is a big example of it. And kind of Doric Sicily, you have the idea of like, a theater play that is the caricaturization of everyday reality, which now we can see that's what internet memes do. They take something that is really mundane um, and they make it into like a caricature into something that is maybe a little bit grotesque and something that we can laugh at, which is the basic kind of logic of many cultural kind of many forms of culture, many forms of art, especially things like theater, music or myths. Talking more specifically about internet memes, when did we really start using that term to refer to something going around on the internet or, or being sent around from person to person? Mm, see, I'm not really sure about that. I guess mm. um, what, what I would say um, is our first understand or the first kind of uh, internet memes were um, what were, were now called, I guess, image ma- macros. So it's the kind of uh, specific, like, let's say a specific picture of a an animal a person um something and then it's got like uh, the impact font top text and the impact font um, yes. bottom text right so that's our like i think that's what really solidified people's ideas about what memes are you know something that we can you know we use the same picture but then change the caption right so i would say that's kind of um the kind of memes that we're really talking about but if you want to go back then i guess you could also say like um we've got things like 
chain emails, for instance, that, those were memes. Um, we've got the kind of a dancing baby gif. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that yeah. one. That is a meme. Um, were they called memes? I'm not so sure, but um, yeah, internet memes. But the in interesting thing is um, before there was the internet, we had this thing called a uh, fax lore, which is also called a uh, kind of Xerox lore in, um, in America, I think. And it was basically these pieces of literature that um, office workers would kind of basically pieces of like collage that they would put together and then they would copy it on a Xerox machine on a, on a copier, they would copy it and then then send it around as mm -hmm. fax. So that was also, that's, that can be considered a form of like an early internet yeah. meme without the internet. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint, but I guess you could say it starts with the kind of proliferation of, you know, these um, machines like printers, things that you, can, that you can use to make lots of copies of something and disseminate very quickly, fax machines. And then that, then it kind of moves on to things that like humorous things, jokes, pictures that you send through email, then maybe instant messengers, and then you get the image macro, basically the meme generator that you cannot uh, find online. And now yeah. we're kind of at this, like the peak of like, I'd say like peak of memory where everything's a meme. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's just one of those words that we use in everyday conversation now, but I can't quite pinpoint when everyone started to use it. Yeah, I think it's just the idea of uh, imitating something and putting your own spin to it. It's like, a, I think it's a very human impulse. So it's existed in one way or another. And we have used technologies to do that. If you think about the technology of um, the printing press or the technology of writing, that is, um, we've used those technologies and now we use the internet or other sorts of like platforms in infrastructure computers to do the same thing that we're maybe compelled to do is to imitate things we see in real life and make them into something that appeals to other people that makes people laugh that entertains them while it seems like this like unique piece of kind of di unique digital object it's actually something i think that's very much a part of us and a part of human history the Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. So let's go into your own research. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what it is that you're, you're researching in relation to memes and digital culture? Yes, um, of course. Um, <laughs> the problem is like knowing when to stop because like once you ask, I think, researchers or PhD students, okay, so what's your PhD about? We, we don't know when to stop. So no, just stop me if I'm getting No, no, to... you go for it. You go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, well... As I said in the beginning, I kind of grew up all over the place. And uh, because I was constantly moving from one city to another because of my family's work, I um, found solace on the internet. It was the one thing that like kept me, um, you know, I would, I would constantly shift from one community to another, but you know, my internet communities, my friends on the internet were always there, you know, I could always, always access them. So my initial kind of, um, I'm studying um, something from the inside, you know, I'm studying online communities as, um, you know, a, a participant of these communities. So, and one of the most kind of, um, one of the things I was most interested in, in you know, on, online was uh, memes. So I make a lot of memes. I look at a lot of memes. And I was, at one point I started thinking, okay, like I understand what vi viral memes are, but what are these other memes that I only make for a small group of my friends and only like these small group of people really understand what I mean. So that kind of 
got me thinking about the, you know, what we use memes for in online communities, um, which then kind of led me to um, kind of led me to this research project um, that I ended up doing my master's on. So I looked at, initially I was looking at how Turkish um, digital citizens or netizens, whatever you want to call um, um, them, how I was interested in how they used memes as a, por- um, as a form of political um, dissidence. Because it's a, um, it's a country that uh, has quite a stringent laws um, about the internet, about what you're supposed to say, what you're allowed to say on the internet. There's a lot of online censorship. I was interested in how people were using memes to kind of bypass mm. those laws. And after that, I did my um, master's in London. And after that, I realized that there was a lot more that I, was, that I wanted to know about you know, memes and online communities and um, decided to kind of um, embark on my, my PhD at um, the University of Edinburgh. And here, what I'm studying um, in my, for my research is I'm looking at a meme community on Instagram that is quite, that I wouldn't consider a viral community, but they do have quite a lot of members, some, somewhere maybe around 20 to 50 uh, thousand people that engage with these memes. Um, I'm looking at how they use memes within their um, community. So do they use it as part of um, subcultural capital, something that shows community belonging, or do they use it as um, a form of currency? Do they use it as a uh, way to create solidarity in a precarious job market? And um, how do they monetize their memes to create careers, um, artistic, cultural careers out of them? And uh, I do this by, um, I've done, so I do interviews, I do digital ethnography, I do uh, auto-ethnography, which is kind of a contentious topic uh, for sociologists, I think, because it can often be seen as navel gazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I also do a little bit of kind of creative research. I create my own memes. I run my own meme accounts. I try to kind of em- em- embody that community through um, both perspe- perspectives as an audience member and as a creator. Yeah. So that's a really long-winded way of <laughs> explaining my kind of academic journey. No, I'm interested it's interested in the interviews in particular. And so what's mm-hmm. the most kind of common feedback in terms of how people get into it or, or the reasoning behind why they're doing it? Right. So um, the reason why people get into it is usually because it's very similar to my story where um, they feel for one way or not, for one reason or another, they feel um, isolated from their kind of physical, let's say, uh, geographic communities and they uh, go online in a search for um, meeting people with their own kind of subcultural interests that can be mean you know people who are in, interested in uh, really niche games like video games or anime or a specific kind of music um, a specific kind of aesthetic politics it can be all sorts of different reasons and once people get into these communities they want to create something for their communities create things that make um, other you know their online friends or people in the community happy and uh, they want to entertain them so that's usually where it starts um, where like meme creators start from the most interesting bit about these interviews however is um, less about kind of how they start because it's usually, you know, uh, younger people who are kind of. Uh, one of my interview interviewees has um, told me that she was um, born on the internet, for instance. So people, they're usually people who really have a kind of close affinity with inter- digital technologies already. But what was really interesting to me um, through as I was doing these interviews were. Um, creators who had established, let's say, maybe like 
a, a following of 5,000 followers plus. They all had this sense of anxiety about the platforms that they were using. So they would tell me, you know, I'd ask them, ask them about, you know, how do your memes get popular? How do you, um, how do you share them? What's your, when you make a meme, are you interested that it's going to go uh, viral? What's, what's the kind of creative process like? And um, the discussions usually end up somewhere um, where we're talking about the platform as this black box because, you know, the way that their memes get disseminated are entirely based on, you know, whether the algorithm likes them, whether, you know, the algorithm wants to share certain memes and whether the algorithm wants to kind of um, hide or conceal some of the stuff that they make. Sometimes they're even censored um, by these platforms. So they always say, I don't know how to, you know, that we don't know how these algorithms work. Um, there are these like kind of hidden concealed things. Um, and I want to, this creates like a sense of anxiety for me. I don't know if I'm sometimes, most of them kind of depend on these, on their platform, on their uh profiles on these platforms to make money so it has a, a direct effect on their life on their financial stability and you know when you think of a workplace um, you think um, of a place where you know what you need to do to be a successful employee you know that usually you know that you have to hit certain targets of yeah. um, whereas if you're a platform worker if you if you're um, completely dependent on a platform for your um, to earn a living, um, those things kind of just disappear because you don't know what the algorithm wants from you, which is obviously done on purpose by the platform. So um, the most interesting thing for me during these interviews was this algorithmic anxiety that I found. Interesting. You just mentioned, you know, monetization. Is, is that a key principle behind why someone does get into it to make money? Or is that kind of a byproduct of doing it in the first place? Um, so it depends on the person, I think, or the group of people that you're looking at. Um, there's, I'd say there's two camps of people on these platforms. Um, one, the, I think the viral meme consuming audience and viral meme creators, I think they have pretty... Uh, explicit goals of wanting to go viral and if yeah. you do get viral then you can think do things like um, um, have ads on your on your page and you can um, do sponsorships that um, or make memes for brands for instance which has happened before someone's made a meme for Gucci for instance and so you can be you can be you can get lots of opportunities from going viral whereas um, the people that I kind of work with the people that I, um, I've interviewed are people who consider themselves multimedia artists. So that's their main way of identifying their occupation is they consider themselves artists. So they're making memes so they can get, um, I don't know how to explain this, but they're making memes so they can get some attention for their for their art, which yes. is the kind of main uh, main goal of their of their work online. And that, of course, um, those two logics are they're they're kind of entrepreneurial logics that are kind of different from each other. They might use the, the same tactics, but the end goal is a bit different. Whereas one let's say one group of people, they're fine with being called meme creators and they can just kind of, I guess, milk that as long as they want. Um, and on the other side, you've got other people who are more interested in making art rather than making memes. Yeah. And this is perhaps a difficult question because you just said this is the, the search that meme, meme creators are looking for is what mm -hmm. sends something viral? You know, there, if we, there must be thousands millions of these being produced every day and, and mm -hmm. is there something that sends some into the stratosphere in some laying dormant i i wish i knew the answer yeah. to this because <laughs> i'd be making memes like crazy exactly, yeah. <laughs> um i guess it just has to i think it's a matter of timing 
again, like, I don't want to use the same example over and over again, but the cold Bernie meme just yeah. shows, I think, um, exactly how a meme can go viral. It's So some of the kind of elements is that I think the timing has to be right. So the Bernie meme obviously coincided with the American inauguration, uh, which has been obviously like a huge, it's not just an in a, in a inauguration, it's something that is, ex has been contested very publicly. So we've all been kind of, I guess many people have been glued to their screens seeing what's happening. Um, so it has to, you know, it has to, I think, tie into some sort of cultural zeitgeist in this, yeah. uh, in this um, kind of situation. We've got po um, a political zeitgeist. And then some, like me, Bernie is someone that's been memed previously. So it's someone that people recognize um, outside of politics, I think, as part of uh, internet culture. You know, he's, uh, he's been memed before in the, I don't know if you might have seen it, where he says, I'm, I'm once again asking for your etc. And then, yes. um, so that's like one meme that went viral. Um, the other thing is, you know, he's done an interview with um, Cardi B, for instance. So he's constantly, he's in the kind of popular, like, cult, popul popular cultural um, perspective. So I think it has to be, timing popularity the kind of zeitgeist and i think cuteness as well yes <laughs> the internet loves cute um the internet loves zany so um one thing that i think was like um, a key aspect of the bernie meme was the mittens and is just general demeanor you know yeah. Um, so I guess it would be those four things. I'm sure there are other sorts of like elements that are just as important, but to me, those four things I think maybe are the most important. Yeah, I'm re really interested in that because it's almost kind of satire, isn't it? And it's very much uh -huh. an indictment of what's happening at the time. Uh, I was thinking the two kind of big ones going around at the moment are obviously the Bernie one you just mentioned, and then also the the four lads one, which is very big at the time of recording. And that one really interests me because that picture wasn't taken a few weeks ago it was taken a while ago and I just wondered why it took a while to suddenly snowball and take off I really don't know see the thing is like I'm gonna admit that I don't really understand the four lads moment. okay yeah I'm, I'm sure you've uh, seen it going around right yeah I have it's the I've seen it um oh so this is kind of crazy as well I've seen it where um they're singing that TikTok sea shanty yes. that's gone viral the yes. Wellerman I think it's called I've seen that one, and that one is, I think, quite a beautiful way of kind of seeing the way that memes are remixed over and over again. Yes, yeah. And also a way of seeing that, you know, memes are not just stationary, like uh, kind of uh, stable images. They, they can also be, um, they don't have to be static images. They can be dynamic things. For instance, Crystal Abedin very re recently talked about um, uh, TikTok audio as audio memes. So it's like a mix of two genres of memes. Like the, it's got the audio, it's got the kind of um, the what's it called? The face. Yes. Um, is that thing? <laughs> yeah, whatever it's called, the movement. Yeah, the movement. Itself. Yeah, the uh, yeah the the face um, tune something. I don't know, but it's got like almost like three types of uh, memes. It's yeah. mashed into one and. Like, I think if you're looking for a popular meme, that combination of things should do it. Yes. I just wondered with that one, for those that, for those who don't know, it's, it's four, four lads on a night out. Um, they're all quite muscular and uh, their fashion sense is quite kind of unique as well, I suppose. But I, I just wondered if it had tapped into the fact that most of us are now on lockdown and we can't go out and it reminded us of a happier time when we could all mix together, the sun was shining, they were having a pint, you know. I just oh wondered if God. it was kind of um, it, it's kind of idealistic view of how we lived just a year and a half ago. Oh my God, I, totally. I think that's a great point because, yeah, when I look at those lads, I immediately think of Love Island yes. and better times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, it'll tell us something else about your, your research. Where are you going with it now? What's the next step? 
Um, so I'm currently writing up my uh, kind of thesis and I've got, I've kind of, <laughs> um, I'm now set on the three aspects of niche meme communities that I'm looking at. I'm looking at how uh, they're used as forms of digital public intellectualism, how memes can be used to create political conversation, how they can speak to one another, respond to one another. I've also been looking at how they can be um, used as currency. Mm. And I'm also looking at how they can be used to create mutual aid networks. Um, so those three things are what I'm focusing on currently. Um, my, the most, I think the most interesting one out of those three things is um, the use of uh, memes as um, to create mutual aid networks. And I kind of, I was really interested in that point because it shows a, um, a it's a form of platform resistance. It's a, it's a form of resistance against um, neoliberal entrepreneurial ways of um, making things of, of cultural production. Um, so, the people that I look at, they do things like account takeovers. Bigger accounts will um, basically give out their accounts for, um, let's say, like a week or so to smaller accounts, to political um, initiatives. So they make their visibility, their most kind of uh, valuable form of capital on these platforms. They make their vi online visibility available to smaller um, groups of people. I think that was really, I think that's a really brilliant way of kind of pushing back against algorithmic politics. Uh, so they will do things like that. They will also, um, there's lots of meme creators who've set up their own initiatives, for instance, for things like um, um, self-defense training. They've done things like anti-prison, prison, prison ab abolitionist um, um, initiatives. They've done things like um, initiatives that help uh, people out with food. Um, so, you know, I, that it, that's the most exciting bit for me yeah. is the kind of hidden social, um, the social sociality of meme networks is what's m most interesting to me. I am also, you know, there's something coming out um, in a few, I think maybe weeks or months about um, the idea of digital patronage. So I'm writing about that quite, quite a lot. So things like Patreon and Twitch. Um, and those are um, some things I'm interested about and hopefully I'll take them kind of a bit forward in my research in the next um, in the coming years. That's great. And it's interesting to hear that memes goes beyond just getting an image of Bernie Sanders sent to your phone. It's much, much better. <laughs> um, Definitely. Thank you, Edward. Could I just ask you to let the listeners know where they can find out more about you? I know that you have got your own website. Yeah, I've got so many websites, <laughs> too many, I think. Um, so you can find me on um, idilgalip.com or you can also find me on Twitter, which is just idilgalip. Um, uh, please also follow our Meme Studies Research Network. We're also on Twitter as Meme Studies RN. Um, and that's, yeah, that's all for me. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much, Matthew. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. <laughs>